it's many years since I was in Halifax and uh, I'm glad to be back, even though it's in a, a virtual way. What I'd like to do today is first of all, uh, explain a little bit about my own background and about the period of time I spent in captivity. As you've already heard, I had five years, almost five years in very strict uh, solitary confinement. And when I speak about that, I would like to speak about my own uh, spiritual life in that experience, how I managed to keep that alive and how I managed to keep hope alive. Um, and how in that particular and peculiar situation, one was able to create what one might describe as a sacred space. More about that in a moment. Then I'd like to move on and talk about sacred spaces uh, in the world, away from confinement, and look at that, look at the different aspects of sacred space, what they mean, and what they can mean uh, for us today, and how important they can be in enabling us to find harmony uh, and growth in life. So first of all, back to my own uh, experience. I've spent much of my life uh, working in different parts of the world and living in different parts of the world, predominantly in Africa, but not exclusively so. I was in Uganda with my wife and children at the time of the Amin coup, and it was there that I had my first experience of negotiating for the release of people who'd been illegally detained. And more than that, uh, in Uganda, I came across, because of the coup, the most appalling scenes of carnage and destruction. Uh, churches were destroyed, but more importantly, people were destroyed. And many hundreds, thousands indeed, were murdered, including many of my own colleagues. Now, I wouldn't wish anyone listening today to go away with the impression that all Ugandans are brutal, insensitive people. That would be a travesty of the truth. Uh, they are, in the main, good, happy, contented people. But when order breaks down in society, when someone like a, a despot comes along and takes control of the situation, gives the army license to loot and to kill, destroys the law and order and the police force. When that happens, all hell breaks loose. And it doesn't matter which society you're in. We've seen examples of that in North America, in certain places where racial tensions have got to boiling point. Law and order has been despised and broken down and has been the most dreadful trouble. It can happen in any part of the world. Hostage taking uh, is something that I began to learn uh, about hostage negotiation in Uganda and didn't follow it up intensely until much later on when I was appointed to be an advisor to the then Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury, who is Primus Inter Pares of the Anglican Communion, uh, that means the senior Archbishop of the Anglican Communion, um, he uh, lives uh, uh, partly in Lambeth Palace, mainly in Lambeth Palace of London, on the banks of the Thames, uh, but he has also a, a home in Canterbury Cathedral. But his office is in Lambeth, and that is where I was based. Around the world, to arrange his diplomatic encounters, to arrange his meetings with heads of state, to arrange his visits to ordinary parishes, and people, and generally to deal with problems that occurred in the Anglican Communion from time to time and that were referred to Lambeth Palace. Uh, it was a time in the uh, late 70s when hostage taking was rife. Um, hostages, particularly in the Middle East and almost predominantly in 
Beirut, unfortunately. Hostages were disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, and before that, uh, in uh, Iran, uh, that too was a place where hostage taking was uh, very frequent. We had a small Anglican church in Iran. The bishop's son was murdered. The bishop was forced into exile. His secretary, uh, a, a lady working with the CMS, Church Mission Society, she was shot and left for dead. Um, and the senior clergy, together with some lay workers, disappeared. That was my first encounter with negotiating at that level in Uganda, in, in Iran, for hostages. I said to the Archbishop, when this happened, I better get out there and see what I could do. I did get out there and I was able to meet with revolutionary guards and to cut a long story short, was able to find uh, an effective resolution to the problem, which meant that the hostages, all of them, Iranian and British, were released without payment and without false exchange. It can be done through negotiation. People have said to me, and said to me before I went to Iran, it's impossible, you'll never be able to do anything with revolutionary guards. If that was not true. Once they gave me their word, they kept it. Alas, things are still bad in Iran. And only this afternoon, earlier this afternoon in the UK, I attended a seminar again online, which was detailing some of the dreadful things that are taking place in that country at the moment, which is under intense and severe pressure. Um, from Iran, I was in Libya with Colonel Gaddafi, negotiating for the relief there, and then in Beirut. You can't do a job like that of negotiating for the release of hostages without recognizing that you might be killed or captured. And my view on that is this, that you should know full well before you take up that sort of work, the risks entailed. And if you're not prepared to take those risks, as I wouldn't blame anyone for not taking them, um, if you're not prepared to take them, don't do that work because the dangers are very great. You think about them, you weigh up the situation, and then you tend to put the problems to the back of your mind and just get on with the job that needs to be doing. People have said to me, but did you not think that God had given you special protection? Well, to be on, the answer to that is, I don't think so, no. I think as human beings, we all take our chances. Uh, we all face difficulties. I don't think simply because we're believers, we get special protection. I think what we do have we have the availability of resources which enable us to uh, work through some of the chronic difficulties that face us in life and they face most people, whatever they may be, whether they be captivity or whether they be more, more ordinary, if you like, uh, uh, problems. We have the resources, but not necessarily the protection from. As it happened in Beirut, things went wrong. To cut again, a long story short, I was told that I could, in fact, uh, see hostages who were about to die, or one was about to die. And I said, if I come, you'll keep me. And they said, no, we won't. And I had to debate with myself whether or not to go. And I did go and was captured. Um, again, I would say to you, don't think that I am full of altruistic motives. And that means I'm always thinking of the others. Um, I think any time we do something for other people, consciously or unconsciously, we're doing something for ourselves. Uh, in my case, my reasoning was as follows. If I'm told that someone is about to die, and I was, and if that man dies, and I haven't got the courage of my conviction to go and visit him, then I shall have to live with my conscience for the rest of my life. That is how my reasoning went. And so I went back and I was, um, the usual procedures followed. I was taken to a safe house, blindfolded, of course. I was given the change of clothing. I was examined to see if I was carrying 
any locator devices. I was kept in a dark room for four or five days, blindfolded. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is to shake off a tail if in case anyone was following me. And then after five days or thereabouts, I was taken at night in a car with armed uh, people in the car to a location where I was told I was going to see the hostages. We came, we drove into an underground garage. The, uh, I was looking through the blindfold or beneath the blindfold, not through it, but beneath the blindfold. I could see a trap door in the floor. I was told to jump down. I did so. I heard a door close behind me and I was in a tile cell. And it was at that point that my blood ran cold because I realized that these cells were tiled in order so that people were beaten up, they were easier to clean. There were several other cells down there and it was an eerie place. It was an underground prison. And to this day, I don't know who my fellow prisoners were because we had to keep absolute silence. There was no question of communicating with other prisoners or with other people down there. I was moved from time to time, usually to bombed out building um, at, where I, I was put on the third or fourth floor in a, a room, which was a dark room where, mat where metal shutters were put in front of the window so no natural light came in. Staples were driven into the wall uh, so that uh, I was chained to the wall for 23 hours and 50 minutes a day with one visit to the bathroom. I slept on the floor. I had uh, no books or papers for over three and a half years. Uh, there was nothing, nothing at all. Uh, just, uh, I had to be sitting there on the floor, on a mattress, sleeping on the floor and visiting the bathroom once a day. No conversation with anyone, no one to talk to, a complete and absolute solitude. Well, in that situation, um, again, you have opportunity, certainly you have opportunity to think, uh, and you also have many opportunities to be afraid. I was um, beaten on the soles of the feet um, because they believed, my captors wrongly believed that I was an agent of government, in other words, a secret agent, and that I knew and had information that they wanted and if so, they beat me to see if they could get that information from me. Of course, I had no such information. Um, I was told I had five hours to live and I was uh, taken into another room and faced uh, people blindfolded, of course. Uh, at that point, I felt um, I was afraid, not of death as such, but afraid of to how I might die. Would they shoot me? Would I be beheaded? How would I die? Um, they asked me if I wanted anything and I said I'd want to drink because my throat had gone dry because of fear. They gave me something to drink. They let me write a letter uh, or a, a composite letter to my family and friends. They let me say a prayer. I said the Lord's Prayer out loud. And then they said, turn and face the wall. So I turned around and I felt cold metal at my forehead and then they dropped it and said, another time. That was the end of the first year. Uh, they said then that they believed me and that I was a humanitarian. And those are not their exact words, but that's what their meaning was. And they said they were going to release me. I was put into a private house, uh, locked in that house, of course, for a couple of weeks. And at the end of two weeks, instead of releasing me, I went sent back into normal hostage accommodation for another, what was it, four years, almost four years. I have no idea what went wrong at that point or why they changed their mind. And so in this very isolated situation, without books or without papers, um, what about my own, my own inner life? How did I, how did I, how did I cope with that? Well, I used to set aside a space uh, each day. First thing you have to do is to create a structure for yourself. It's very easy in total isolation to, be to become totally disorientated, particularly if you're kept in the dark. 
uh, permanently in the dark. Now, I was not kept for long permanently in the dark, sometimes just a matter of days. And the problem with that is you lose all sense of orientation. Um, you wake up in what is the middle of the night and you think it may be the middle of the morning. You have no idea. And quickly, you can be totally disorientated and begin to uh, lose reason, uh, lose your mind. Fortunately, I wasn't in total darkness for very long periods of time. And always, when metal shutters are put in front of the window, when the sun rises, there's usually a small crack in the window through which the beams of sun come and you know it's daylight. And I used to say to myself, remember, light is stronger than darkness. And that little chink of light gave me some hope that light was stronger than darkness. But again, one had to think about this business of creating some, developing some spiritual life. Now here, I was very fortunate, very fortunate indeed, because I'd been brought up as an Anglican, as it happens, that was my tradition, and brought up with the uh, Book of Common Prayer. Now, no longer do we have the old Book of Common Prayer, but as a boy and as a chorister, we went through that book week after week after week until it had imprinted itself in my mind. Now, years later, when I had no books, I could remember, I could remember Psalms. I could remember the um, colleagues of the church. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. A small colic, a small prayer, and yet a, a colic with great meaning when you're in the dark and when you are afraid. I can remember the Magnificat, the Nuncomitus, of course, the Creed. It was all there. And I had this precious store that no one could take away from me. The beauty of words, um, what one seeks in isolation like that, I think what we all seek in different ways, or many people seek in different ways, is to be in harmony, to be in harmony with ourselves, to be in harmony with our neighbor, to be in harmony with our environment, to be in harmony with God. And one of the purposes, I think, of prayer is to enable us to be in harmony, in harmony with ourselves, in harmony with our neighbor, in harmony with our environment. And so often we're not. We use the environment, uh, we abuse it, uh, we take it for granted and we see, we <laughs> often think we're the controllers of it. Well, as we've seen in the pandemic, <laughs> it can bite back and very savagely indeed. We're not in harmony with our environment. We're not in environment with our, with our world in so many ways where everything is given a monetary value judged by its monetary worth. But life is not just about money. Of course, money is important. Money is important to enable us to have decent uh, standard of living for ourselves and for our families. But it's not the criteria by which you can judge everything. I had nothing in those years. Um, I had simple food, very simple food, no medical care, nothing. But somehow, it was an opportunity for me to grow to a greater inner harmony. And that was done partially through the power of words, through the rhythm of words, through the rhythm of language. This is something we should not despise uh, or underplay in our church worship. Often in many situations these days, there is no regularity of language in church worship. Uh, some ministers or priests or others uh, take the, the service as though it's something that could be made up on the spot each week. Well, um, I think if that happens, and it happens in certain places, I think if that happens and the value of regular language is lost, we have lost a precious asset. 
each day in captivity, I saved um, a small piece of bread that I'd be given for my uh, breakfast and some water that I had put in the bottom of a plastic cup. And I laid out paper tissue on the floor and I took another paper tissue and folded it and made it into the shape of a cross. And I put that before me on the ground. And uh, I said to myself, the communion service, I'm not a clergyman, I'm a layman. There's nothing to prevent you saying a communion service. I said that to myself each day. But as I did it, I also in my mind linked myself with churches uh, and congregations that I'd known in the life when I was free and, no, and not a captive. And so in my mind, I'd picture these places and I'd take myself there and I'd say the communion service. And I knew that as I was saying that service, there were others around the world who were also saying that service, using the same words, giving, having the same focus, and I could link with them. So I was not alone. I was with a much broader company of people, even though I couldn't see them. And that, for me, meant a, 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 great, a great deal. It enabled me to feel that I belonged, that I was there. I can't say, and I must be honest with you, I can't say that I ever felt the close presence of God in that situation. Some people claim to feel the warm, comforting, close presence of God. I, I, I can't say that I felt that. But I didn't mean to say, some people think if you say that, then uh, you have lost your faith. Well, that is not true. Uh, what, what it is, what it means is this, that feelings are so unreliable as a total and sole guide to how you are. Your feelings can be affected by your mood, by your mental state, by your physical conditions, by a thousand and one things. And if you, enable, if you make your faith totally dependent on feeling good, then I think that is a mistake. Um, and because one did not feel that close presence, doesn't mean to say that one was uh, lacking in faith or belief. Um, one could still uh, follow slowly, quietly, diligently the, the, the service as it was there in my head and join with others. To move away from captivity, just to look quickly at so what that might mean, what sacred spaces might mean. I created the sacred space for myself, both within and out in that little cell. There was that place before me, that little tissue, that cross, that just that little place in front of me. There was my sacred space. I could enter into it and I could be gently and slowly growing into a greater harmony with myself and with God. Uh, surely, that is, as I said earlier, a part of the meaning of prayer. It's not just to constantly ask for things, oh, free me, get me out of here, do this, that, or the other. Not so, that's not the real prayer. The real prayer I would suggest to you is to grow into, as I keep repeating, grow into that harmony, that relationship, so that eventually one may find a greater peace, peace for yourself, peace for your neighbor, peace in the world. Looking at architecture, of course, the different forms of church architecture do reflect our spiritual sons. I, uh, uh, an, an Anglican, and I remain an Anglican, I have broad, I have to say, ecumenical sympathies, as I've lived in Rome, and I worked on secondment to the Roman Catholic Church for a number of years, for seven years in fact, but I'm also a Quaker, I'm a rather odd mix, a Quaker and an Anglican, some people have called me a Quanglican, because I seem to mix the two traditions. Why a Quaker? What, what Quakers? and Anglicanism. 
Well, just let me take two examples. You go into a Quaker meeting house, a society of friends. You go into that uh, a Quaker meeting house, which is very plain. It's very beautiful, but it's very plain, very simple. Uh, there are chairs in a circle. There's a table in the center, usually with a bowl of flowers and very little else, very little else indeed. You sit, around, you sit for the service, the service lasts an hour. There's no singing. Uh, this is in the English Quaker tradition. There was no singing. Um, and no uh, one actually leads the meeting. You speak as you are led and you um, make your contribution if you feel you have a contribution to make. Sometimes you can go for weeks and never say a word. And sometimes a whole service goes without anyone speaking whatsoever. Sometimes two or three will speak. It's not a place to make great speeches. It's a place where you can express what you believe you are being led to express at that time. It's quiet, it's simple, it's plain. It reflects, in a sense, the structure of the building, reflects the interior life, the deep silence, quietness of the interior life. That is what it, in part, uh, reflects. And the reason I um, participate in the Quaker worship is because I believe in the positive power uh, uh, of silence. Something that we have never in our, my own tradition, in the Anglican tradition, never been really comfortable with, never been able to really get hold of. Our services are full of movement, full of uh, activity. Uh, and somehow in that activity, well, there is little room for silence, there's little room for contemplation. When I was um, many years ago, before the revision of the prayer book, I would often go to the early morning service, the eight o'clock service. And for that service, I could, uh, as a member of the congregation, remain kneeling for the whole of that service. And I didn't even have to respond, not verbally, but I could participate in it, uh, in, in, in the silence, in the quiet. A lot of that has gone now. Uh, you're expected to stand, to sit, to shake hands, to move around. And somehow the opportunity for silence within liturgy is not there. Now to take the other, another example, let us move from, let us say, a Quaker meeting house to, let us say, Canterbury Cathedral or St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, a great building, wonderful architecture, beautiful architecture, a building built by people who were building uh, for posterity, who were building for the glory of God. But look at the building, look at the structure, look at the architecture, perfect symmetry. It fits together beautifully. Uh, and somehow as you look at that, it reflects the symmetry, but it's full of color also. The services are full of color, the vestments, you know, when you see the purple vestment, you know it's Lent. When you see white, you know it's Easter. And the movement of the lit in the liturgy is very precise and ordered in a, in a high mass. There you have the precision of movement. It's a drama, it's a great drama. And the cleric in that is the leader of that drama. Uh, and it's done according to precise formula or should be in my view. The people who know that best of all are the Orthodox. And the Orthodox have this in, within their particular tradition, have this marvelous way of combining on the one hand, the order uh, 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 of the drama and the freedom of the individual worshiper to participate in that drama or to be, um, follow their own own way by, for example, in the middle of that, uh, the, the, the Orthodox service, to go away, to light a candle, and then to return. Uh, color, music, symbols. We need symbols, really. I made that symbol in, in the cell, the symbol of the cross, because somehow 
our souls, our minds relate to symbols and symbols speak to us and speak to the unconscious. And the great cathedrals are full of symbols. Not all of them are Christian symbols, but that takes me to the other point that some of our great buildings these days um, have in fact uh, no longer can one find them to be places, sacred places of quiet reflection, which they ought to be in my view. They ought to be a place where you can go and you can feel this is a sacred holy place and it is quiet. Today, so often they become tourist spots where the, the predominant noise is from the cash register uh, and the, the silence has gone. Uh, perhaps there's a small little place to one side saying here you can go for private prayer. But the whole building has been given over, or virtually the whole building has been given over for other purposes as a tourist uh, attraction. Now I understand, I understand very well of course, that the pressure is on churches and cathedrals to uh, raise money to keep them going. But um, what a cost is being paid for that. What a big cost is being paid for that. The, the ritual of the movement, the symbol, the color, the words, all important. And in our little parishes across the country, here in England, I speak of England, but I speak also of many other parts of the world. The churches also are centers of communal life. Uh, sacred spaces which are centers of communal life where the history of that community is recorded and remembered. Um, and sometimes that remembrance now is going, is being destroyed. Many of our churches, which have been declared redundant, are being turned into uh, homes or other for, are used for other purposes. And something there is going and has gone from the community, that center of local history and reflection. Of course, I'm speaking today about sacred spaces uh, purely, almost exclusively, from the position of, um, from the Christian position. I recognize fully that the main religious traditions have their own sacred spaces, and you can think of dozens of them where they're honored and venerated. I would suggest to you that we need them. We need them strongly. We need them to relate so that we can relate to the sacred space that lies within us. And so that we can in fact, in that process of worshiping and being quiet in that sacred space, grow, to repeat what I've said several times, grow in harmony with ourselves, with our neighbors, with our environment, and with God. And with that, I'll uh, stop and throw it open to questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Terry, for um, sharing that perspective with us. And um, yeah, an incredible set of experiences. I think we could all agree. Um, we've had some questions come in uh, while you've been talking, uh, reflecting on some of the conversation that you brought. Um, and I'd just like to start with one which is related, I suppose, to Canadian policy at the moment. The question reads, um, the evolution of Canadian society seems to point less to engagement in formal religion, yet maintains an interest in spirituality. Um, what way might formal religion deal with this apparent need, yet the rejection of formal religion as a means to satisfy the needs for spirituality? I think to recognize for, for those who are the leaders of um, within the, the church, the Christian church, to recognize, first of all, that although it seems as though, and we are in fact growing more and more towards a secular society, to recognize that people still have spiritual needs and to be able to spend time 
with people. Um, I, I have found in myself, I do quite a lot of, this last, this lockdown period um, has been for me a, a good opportunity to, I've been at home most of the time and much of my work has been done online, but it's given me an opportunity to have weekly sessions with people from across the country and indeed from across the world um, to discuss these matters. And as you discuss, you recognize quite clearly that there is a deep spiritual hunger in the vast majority of people. Often they don't know it. So I first, the first thing I would say is for those who are leaders or have a leadership responsibility within the, within the churches, uh, to recognize that and to find ways of engaging with people on that personal level, uh, to meet them at that, at that at the depth which they need to be met. It's not just a question of also of making us a, a jolly service. Well, yes, of course, there are services for children, but somehow I think you notice that the churches like the Orthodox Church are in fact, in many parts of the world, growing in numbers because they're providing almost unconsciously the, the, the symbols and the meaning of that church is relating to people and people are relating to that. And they are, they are, they are moving, moving forward. Um, I don't think that's a very adequate answer, but it's a stab at an answer. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And I mean, so just just building on that, building on a point that you you made earlier um, in your talk, um, when you talked about the the noise that sits within some of the sacred spaces that we have today, albeit in the last year, not very much noise, um, and that's presented its own problems um, for communities and churches. But when you are in that situation where a sacred space is trying to balance the needs of maintaining some sort of commercial presence and understanding the historical interest for the broader uh, community and sort of world travelers, tourists, and so on and so forth. Um, yet there's that need to find private prayer. Given that you have a lot of these situations where it is quite noisy and given that the distractions around you, even when you're in captivity, how is it that you think people uh, can best find that quiet space in their lives today and moving forward? I think it's a question of your, your total attitude towards life, uh, what you recognize to be valuable in life. Um, also to perhaps put aside time for yourself when you can be by yourself, when you can be alone, when you can be quiet. Um, there was a time I recognized in my own life when I found silence to be almost intolerable. You know, I had to have something like music in the background or, or what have you, some other distraction going on because the silence was overpowering, overwhelming. It took me a long time actually to grow into silence, to learn to appreciate and value it and recognize its healing properties. Uh, and you have to give yourself uh, that time. I think there is a, a growing movement in the UK, I don't know about America. There's a growing movement for people who, of people who want to go on to retreat uh, for two or three days, often silent retreats where they don't speak for two or three days and maybe have uh, someone uh, leading retreat, give an address, and then they go away and quiet for the rest of the time. I would recommend that. I think it's a one way of beginning to train yourself and equip yourself to get the most out of silence. Uh, if you just, uh, and you're doing it in company with other people, but silently with other people, it's something you have to learn. It's something you have to grow into, just, just happen. Um, and you don't find the benefits of it and most of us don't anyway, for quite a long time. But I think it's, uh, it, it is well worth pursuing to have that, grow into that greater sense of inner calm, of inner harmony. 
And, and have your building on that, have your experiences in captivity, um, have they changed the way you appreciate loneliness and the way you oh, deal with loneliness? Definitely. Loneliness, uh, loneliness really is a state of mind. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily the absence of people. You can be in the middle of a big city, surrounded by people and desperately lonely. Um, desperately lonely, and one meets many people like that. Loneliness is really something that's quite terrible, but it is a state of mind. Uh, often in, in these last, uh, this last year, in company with many other people, I haven't seen anyone for uh, two or three days, hardly spoke with anyone for two or three, certainly not face to face, sometimes on the web, yes, but not face to face. But I can't say that I've been lonely. Now, years ago, I would have been. And why, why not now? Well, because, as I said, I learned the hard way how to grow into silence, how to grow and make solitude a positive in one's life. Um, and where you begin to make solitude, um, respect it and make it a positive in your life, then that, in part, deals with this problem of loneliness. Now, of course, there is, there is uh, pain for all of us in life. If you've lost, for example, someone who is a, a loving and uh, companion, a good friend, you are bound, unless you're incredibly insensitive, you're bound to feel the pain of that. And unfortunately, you know, there is uh, pain is a part of life. It's there, it's with us, and you'll feel that pain. But, uh, um, and you will always feel, uh, or many people will always feel that sense of loss. But it doesn't mean to say that you need to fall into despair and fall into um, abject loneliness. Uh, life is a process. We're moving through life. You will die. We, will, we are born. We die. We shall all die eventually. Take life now. Take it one step at a time. This is what I said to myself in captivity. Live for the day, live for now, live fully for the moment, live now. Um, and you will find that as you go into that, uh, loneliness becomes a thing of the past. And, and so an interesting perspective on that, uh, so another sort of, I suppose, a different way of looking at that is when you're thinking of loneliness and you're thinking about this in, in terms of captivity, um, and you, you were trying to find those moments of, of um, you know, living for that day. No doubt you would have probably prayed for your captors. You would have prayed for the neighbours that you thought would have been sort of in the same complex or being held with you in the same way that you reflected on people worshipping with you and that was a source of comfort. But when you think about how, you know, so the, the question that comes through is, well, when you when you prayed for your captors, if that's what you did, how and what ways did you do this? And how did you bring yourself to that point where you would pray for them? Well, this, do it, I did it this way. Um, I was, uh, let me just think, tell you my reflection when I was being beaten on the soles of the feet by someone I couldn't see. I was blindfolded, I was lying on my back and I couldn't see him. And of course, I felt afraid. I was afraid and I felt acute pain, yes. But at the same time, I felt a deep sympathy. I felt a sympathy for that man because I said to myself, how is it that a fellow human being can bring himself to do such a thing. And, and for me, that was comparative, but beating is comparatively minor. Many, many, many more terrible things have been done and are being done today by other human beings against other human beings. It's, it's happening all the time. And you say, what? Well, they're in the grip of something that's purely negative. And how can they be released from that grip? And you just try, and I tried, in the best way possible. First of all, to feel that sympathy for them, 
in because they are caught in that negativity and somehow to try and hold them if you like in the old quaker way to try and hold them in the light and in that way pray for them but i think part of the answer is to have that deep sympathy for the human condition which is a divided condition we have all within us who you know the the positive side and the negative side and part of this business of about all the time going into harmony is to somehow try and find that integration between the two so that we become more whole people and we can pray for others that they may become that also and a, and a question that builds on that that's just been posted into the chat is um asking did you ever have a chance to speak with your captors about spiritual things? Was there ever a chance to share together with them any common sense that the judge of the whole earth will judge us all someday? No, I'm afraid there wasn't. I, I'm afraid I used to say to my captors right at the beginning, um, does it not say in the Quran, you mustn't steal? And they said, no, no, we mustn't steal. I said, how is it you steal me? You've stolen me from my family. You've stolen my life. They said, we'd better go and ask the chief about that. So they went away and sometime later they came back. And I said, what did the chief say? They said, the chief said, we mustn't talk with you anymore. So I'm afraid I got nowhere with that. No, there was no conversation with them at all, I'm afraid, of any significance just a few cursory words now and again. And um, there we are, that was that, it was nothing. And, and so another question, um, and we'll just take a couple more and, and then we'll, we'll let you continue with your evening. Um, when we think about um, the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening, you know, was, was pushed through sort of predominantly in the US initially and has now become a global movement. When you think about that movement that's happening today and you, the importance of that, um, think back to your time in Africa and your, your career in Africa and your perspective on that. What is your, in thinking about the, the value of human life and in Africa, a place where often the value of human life is, is so easily dismissed, um, what's your perspective on movements like the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, in a sense, I think it's inevitable. It's inevitable that there's going to be a reaction against what is seen to be years of repression. I <clears throat> do not myself believe in what some people seem to believe, seem to believe, maybe they don't, in that you rewrite history uh, and thereby uh, topple statues of people who have been um, not altogether brilliant in the way in which they've conducted their lives. Um, I think that is rewriting history. I think you, you look at the past and you look at it from the perspective of today when we have a greater respect, hopefully, for each other and a greater respect for people of different races. And we should learn from the past. That's just another thing, incidentally, about, um, about the importance of, of church buildings. You know, they put us in touch with the past when we go into a church building which is an older building and we see memorials from the past they put us in touch with the past and they help us recognize that we are part of a long ongoing tradition and as far as the black lives movement go as i say i think it's it's inevitable i would hope that in pressing for what they're pressing for they don't fall into the trap of becoming violent and aggressive and in themselves taking on some of the uh, characteristics that they have suffered from by others in the past. Uh, but it's all part of this movement towards, I suspect, and I hope, uh, a greater society where people are not judged in any way negatively by the color of their skin or by their ethnicity, or by their background. It's an important perspective and an important point. Um, I, I have no way of segueing to this next question um, from that. 
Um, so I'm just going to go with it and just come through on the chat. A bit more of a deep uh, theological question, but actually relevant to what you're talking about in terms of the way in which worship takes place in churches and in sacred places. Um, the, the comment reads, um, thank you for your comments about the importance of regular words so that they become deep in our memories and in our lives. Um, some, such as Ian Robinson, have argued that the rhythmic quality of Cranmer's English prayer book is one of the reasons that it's memorable. Do you think this is the case? And if so, what are the best ways we can continue to preserve such books for our own spiritual growth? And how do we make the case that regular words matter? Well, I've tried to make a case myself today that regular words do matter. And I think, you see, just going back on what I said, the, 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 the person who put that question is absolutely right. The words are memorable. They have a rhythm and a flow, and we relate to that rhythm. And um, in some ways, though, now, it might be in some cases rather like learning a new language, but it's, uh, it's possible it, it happens, it can take place. We have a modern service, uh, a, a super modern service, put it like that, is conducted. And the person leading it, half the time is making up uh, the service as he goes along, making up prayers as he goes along. There's no, you don't remember that. If you were then, if that's all you've had, and years later, um, you uh, are in a situation where you can't attend church service, there is nothing to remember, nothing at all. It's not lodged in your mind. Now you might say, well, that should stimulate you to use your own words and make your own prayer. But there is a great value in that uh, form of words which you can relate to and which you can um, then, uh, in difficult circumstances, they can relate to you in, 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 in the situation in which you find yourself. And how do you do that? Well, I think we should establish within our churches, uh, within every church, there should be a form of service which people can attend where there is the regular use of words and where they're, again, like learning a language. You have to be instructed. You have to grow into it. And um, that can be done. And there are, if you're really seeking for spiritual development and spiritual advancement, you'll be happy to be instructed in that. It means that our clergy, our leaders, have got to be sympathetic, good teachers as well as anything else. And then so a penultimate question then, so uh, which not, again nicely builds on that one, is uh, one of the questions that's come in is to ask, um, what can laymen or lay people do to help promote spiritual health within churches today? Well, I'm a lay person. <laughs> I'm a lay person myself, always have been. I'm not ordained. Um, and I think we can, we can, talk about our own experience. We can find all the opportunities uh, of, of putting some of these arguments. We can read. We should read and study and get immersed in the subject, know our subject, know our church, know our history. There's a lamentable, lamentable, in my view, lack of um, knowledge amongst some church leaders about church history. They haven't the faintest clue about the, the the, the history of the church, it really is important to know that, important to know where you've come from, important to know the developments of, of, of doctrine, of understanding, of belief across the years. And there's no reason why, as a layman, you can't do that. You could read, you can get clued up on all these things, and so you should to become an informed person. And there are many, many laymen like that, of course. Uh, men and women, I say laymen, but of course I include uh, the whole and, but do you, do you not think that some of the lack of history or understanding of history is down to either arrogance in terms of a belief that, you know, no one's had this thought first versus accessibility to be able to access that history and, and understand it and read it and find out about it? Well, I, I, I don't know. I think it's many reasons why there's that. One of the reasons is, of course, people say, oh, we haven't time for that, you know, everything's moving so quickly, we must uh, just uh, keep running on the spot, keep going. 
you've got to make yourself time. Just for these, going back to sacred spaces, you need to say time in life, in the middle of a busy life, to be for yourself, to be quiet, to be with God, to take time to read. I used to divide my day in captivity up into intersections, so much time for exercise, so much time for reading, so much time for reflection. And somehow, I know we lead busy lives, we lead frantic lives, many of us, uh, and have the, you know, the burden and responsibility of keeping going. But still within that, we can find time for reading, for study, for quiet, for ourselves, um, so that we can be more complete, more whole persons ourselves. I have a long way to go. I'm no one to talk, really. And so, and so one final question for you is um, during those dark days when you were in captivity and you would create, created your own sacred space in your mind, um, and when you weren't sure whether you would live or die um, and you had no mental stimulation, uh, when fear could have won, what sustained you? I said something very simple in the face of my captors. I said, you have the power to break my body and you've tried. You have the power to bend my mind and you've tried. But my soul is not yours first. Now I can't give you an accurate and absolute clear definition of soul. In that context, I meant the total person that I am. And I said to myself, even if you kill me, you have not possessed me completely because my soul lies in the hand of God. And that very simple, simple statement was enough to enable me to maintain hope. 